Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. From the Rocky Mountains to the West Coast and on up to Alaska, there are thousands of historic structures and archaeological sites on national park system landscapes. They range in variety from homesteader cabins to prehistoric cave dwellings. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. Taking care of these buildings and archaeological sites is a valuable job for the National Park Service as they speak to the country's history and its prehistory. But it hasn't always been easy for the agency's Vanishing Treasures program, which was created back in 1998. At the time, the administrations have proposed funding cuts for the program, and there's also the issue of too much work for too few staff. To learn more about the problem, its accomplishments, and what it's working on today, we've invited Ian Huff, the National Park Service's Vanishing Treasures Program Coordinator. We'll be back in a minute with Ian. Smokey's Life. Full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smokey's Life Journal is a biannual magazine produced by Smokey's Life, formerly the Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokieslife.org. Embrace the perks of an interior federal membership, where our benefits can save you up to $2,800 a year. Take advantage of discounts on insurance like auto, home, and AD&D. Shop for travel deals. Get a discount on password security and identity theft protection too. Discover all Interior Federal has to offer. Learn more and apply at interiorfcu.org. Federally insured by NCUA. Welcome to The Traveler, Ian. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. You know, my introduction gave a pretty light description of your program and its challenges. Could you give us an overview of the Vanishing Treasures program and why it exists? In general, we're a service program in the Intermountain Regional Office in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And we serve parks, um, as you described, in our geographic region that happens to contain a lot of uh, architectural remains, both on archaeological sites and historic structures, as you mentioned. And those structures have preservation challenges uh, on a daily basis. And the programs within the parks that are responsible for taking care of those resources often have challenges beyond their their capabilities, either because of a lack of staffing or um, a lack of particular technical expertise. So we exist as a program to serve parks in that regard when they're developing preservation projects and run into um, issues in executing those projects um, to preserve the resources then We partner with them as consultants on technical aspects, uh, project development, um, scoping projects, and that kind of thing. Was I accurate in saying there there are literally thousands of of sites that you have to be involved with? Yeah, I mean, technically speaking, that is true. Um, Some of the parks in the southwestern United States have some of the greatest numbers of archaeological sites in the country. And those archaeological sites often contain architectural remains. On top of that, you've got more recent history, uh, including mining history and logging history and mineral extraction history and that kind of thing, um, all of which left a legacy on the landscape, including the remains of, um, as you mentioned in the introduction, um, cabins, industrial Um, sites and buildings and that kind of um, that kind of historical structure. So, yes, if you add all that up, then uh, potentially we are responsible for thousands of sites and thousands of structures. Yeah. So uh, how recent of a structure would qualify for your program? I'm I'm thinking of the the Kennecott mine site up in Wrangell, St. Elias. I mean, certainly that's... um, Uh, a historic site. Is that something that falls under your purview? Yeah, it does. Um, You know, if the parks are responsible for maintaining structures and implementing preservation projects, then we can get involved. So we don't have an age determination or a requirement that, that a building or a structure has to be a certain age or older. Um, if the park is responsible for managing that structure, 
and they have uh, a need for the vanishing treasures uh, technical staff, then we will lend a hand with that. Do, do you have a huge staff? <laughs> we don't. Uh, I think like in all of the national parks, um, we wish we did have a huge staff, but no, our staff is fairly small in comparison to the, in proportion to the region and the number of resources that we, that we assist with. Um, it's myself and then three technical staff and then on occasion interns that join our staff for, you know, a short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, never a shortage of work, I'm sure. Never a shortage of work. Yeah. It's, it's almost guaranteed, but we are getting good at leveraging our relationships with our partners to expand our capacity. And I think that's where the legacy of the Vanishing Treasures program really pays off in the national parks uh, in terms of finding technical experts and cooperators and contractors who do really good preservation work. We can join those partners with the parks and you know help them in that regard, even if the Vanishing Treasure staff doesn't have a crew and we can't travel to help the parks implement the project, we have good partners to help make that happen. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, back in the last century, as I like to say, um, when I was working with the Associated Press in Wyoming, um, this old house, the PBS television series, came out to um, a wilderness area just to the east of Yellowstone National Park up by Matitsi, Wyoming. And there was a, an old cabin there that dated back to the early 19 aughts, I believe. And um, this... Um, eclectic um, artist had convinced uh, Theodore Roosevelt that uh, we needed somebody there to make sure that the sheep ranchers didn't overrun um, Yellowstone and uh, the surrounding forests. But anyway, it, it was in a wilderness area, and so, of course, they couldn't use any um, power tools, um, whether it was electricity or, or a, a gas engine. And it was really interesting, you know, watching them work on this, this old structure do you guys get involved with um, structures or sites in wilderness areas? And, and how do you approach those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the Vanishing Treasures program doesn't draw the line between structures and and buildings and archaeological remains that are located within wilderness versus uh, those that are located outside of wilderness areas. We will uh, help and assist parks implement their projects regardless of that designation. But when we do have wilderness designation and we're helping with a, um, a project, then we let the parks take the lead in terms of the planning that leads up to that project. And, you know, if you're familiar with uh, this cabin outside of Yellowstone, um, you're probably familiar with all of the requirements for doing this kind of work in the wilderness in terms of uh, environmental compliance. So we let the parks take the lead on that in terms of the types of activities that might be restricted in wilderness and how to plan the logistics of getting people and materials to the site and that kind of thing. And it is a challenge. It absolutely is. Uh, most recently, I worked at uh, Wapatki National Monument, and we have many, many, many hundreds of archaeological sites with standing architectural remains in eligible wilderness. And in order to get the crews there, you know, it, it, we have to dedicate quite a bit of uh, time and effort just to um, our travel and getting that material and those people to site. And how we do that, of course, was with non-mechanized equipment. So um, other than the road that we could drive a short section on and, and drop the crew from, then we would have to um, carry everything by hand including ourselves. So, you know, we use uh, backpacks um, called cash haulers that look like a normal backpack, but they're open and it's got a frame and you can load up your buckets with um, soil and sand and all the materials that we need for preservation, water, um, all the tools. Um, we assemble these small kits that go into small buckets and we carry those with the sand and the soil and the water on our backs in these cash haulers and then hike over the uh, desert terrain to get to some of these uh, wilderness sites. And that lengthens the, the, the uh, duration of the project considerably, but 
Yeah. Um, it certainly is doing work um, the correct way in, in light of wilderness designation. You didn't use horses or mules to help carry uh, the gear in, the resources? You know, some parks do that for sure. Um, they they have um, that kind of support. Uh, well, Patki didn't. And so we used um, ourselves, uh, National Park Service staff members, as well as Youth Corps uh, crew members. And so we would use the, the young, strong backs of the Corps members to um, help us get all that equipment into the wilderness area. Interesting. But of course, you know, we're not hiking, you know, into a wilderness where we have to cover 30 miles a day to get to our site. We're, we're talking shorter distances of five to 10 miles. Still though, I'm sure those packs weren't light. <laughs> no, they weren't. <laughs> now, once upon a time, there was the um, Western Center for Historic Preservation, um, another arm of the um, National Park Service. And you guys merged with that and what did that bring to the Vanishing Treasures program? Well, we were merged with them until recently, and now we're back to um, operating independently, at least administratively. We still have a very, very strong partnership with the Western Center. Um, and what that brought us then and what it brings us now is a, a broader team of experts and of uh, a deeper reach into uh, partnerships as well as um, the ability for the Vanishing Treasures program to advertise uh, training workshops as well as training material and expand our, our network in the professional community, the conservation community. And that continues today. Um, and I, I think the biggest benefit is just having more people coordinating and planning and developing training material and training programs that really hit on what the parks need. And, you know, we, we don't have an unlimited number of staff and an unlimited budget to develop these training materials ourselves. But when we partner with the Western Center, we can take advantage of their existing programs in terms of um, really targeting development and implementation of um, those training programs. That's something that the Vanishing Treasures program alone does not have the capability to do. Now, when you're talking about training, um, a lot of that is, is for the general public, I believe, right? I mean, um, some years ago, there was a, a program up at Klondike Gold Rush National Historical Park in Alaska on you know how to preserve um, log structures and whatnot and how, how to do some maintenance on those. And then there was also one in Grand Teton National Park where your team worked with the National Trust for Historic Preservation um, to help rehabilitate the Jenny Lake Historic District at Grand Teton. And I believe that that involves some, some youth um, teaching them some of these skills. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the training programs that we have are targeted to both National Park Service employees involved with preservation, as well as um, the public in terms of uh, consulting, um, private consultants and consulting agencies outside the National Park Service. Um, and so these workshops typically are a blend of National Park Service uniforms, as well as participants from outside the National Park Service. And absolutely, I mean, we try to get creative with developing workshops and trying to get work done, you know, on top of trying to um, bring a structured curriculum in terms of stepping participants through um, a preservation project from start to finish. And I, I think the, the parks benefit from that um, and just in having the time to think through each of those steps and the public, of course, and these partner organizations benefit from the skills that they learned, you know, doing the hands-on workshops, as well as uh, a greater understanding of how the National Park Service approaches uh, preservation. So yes, we, we do um, have a public-facing component to our, our training programs through the, the Western Center. Yeah. This is Kurt Repencheck. We're talking today with Ian Huff, the program coordinator of the National Park Service's Vanishing Treasures program what it's involved with and what projects it's doing in the 
the west from the Rocky Mountains to the west coast and on up to Alaska. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. National Parks Traveler has launched the National Parks RVing Guide, the definitive guide for RVers seeking information on campgrounds in the National Park System. The guide is now available free through the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. If you're a traveler who wants to explore the National Park System, you'll want this app. The guide is packed with details for campgrounds in more than 70 national parks across the country, searchable by park, state, or region. You'll also find feeds of the traveler's content, including our latest stories and podcasts. Download the National Parks RVing Guide and start planning your next trip today. So Ian, um, you know, a lot of the, the work I think initially started out around log structures. Um, homestead or cabins and whatnot, but there's a lot more to that. I mean, you, you've worked down in um, Bandelier National Monument, I believe, on, on the cavates down there and, and doing some some studies and some research. I mean, how does how does your program approach archaeological sites and, and what's its role in, in looking at those sites? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think the Western Center has always had a focus on log structures and their preservation. Uh, the Banner Sheep Treasures Program had its origins in the southwestern United States, where there are a lot of um, standing architectural remains from archaeological sites that are, you know, 800, 900, 1,000 years old or more. And so we do have, and we, we have focused on archaeological structures since the beginning of the program. In fact, it was the deterioration and um, a lack of um, training and an aging workforce back in the 1990s, the middle 1990s, that really caught the attention of not only the, the crew members and the staff who are responsible for preserving those places, but also superintendents and regional directors, and then the national director for the National Park Service, um, understanding that these you know ancient architectural remains were falling apart and we didn't have the capability or the skill to um, preserve them in perpetuity and that something needed to be developed, a program needed to be developed to address those um, structures specifically on archaeological sites. So when we think back at the history of the Vanishing Treasures program, places like Aztec Ruin and Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde and Wapatki and Salinas Pueblo Mission, all of those places um, have archae large archaeological components with uh, above ground standing original walls. And that's a real challenge for people involved with preservation. And the trick is that these are incomplete architectural systems. So we don't have the roofs, we don't have the doors, we don't have the window coverings, we don't have a lot of those features that help the four walls stay together. And so the challenges are how do you work on the walls and maintain them in a condition that we call as found. That is, what did they look like, you know, 100 or 120 years ago when they were first observed? Um, certainly not the first uh, people to see these because these are uh, places with ancestral history and with a descendant community. And so we were certainly not the, the first to see or observe um, these archaeological sites. But uh, when they were first described, you know, that is the condition that we hope to preserve um, the structures in. Uh, and that's challenging because those walls are open to all kinds of environmental stresses. And if you think about wind and rain and heat and flooding and overgrown vegetation. These are all conditions that are pretty typical of archaeological sites in the Southwest. And all of those are impactful to architectural remains. So it's a real challenge to do a little bit of work that um, keeps the walls resilient to um, degradation, but also does not 
replicate or um, uh, present a, a, a structure that's been rebuilt. Uh, we try to avoid that at all cost. Yeah, and, and I guess it's uh, in some aspects it can be a, a daunting program for for the National Park Service as a whole because you have the known structures and the unknown structures when you look at uh, um, parks as big as say Glen Canyon National Recreation Area or um, the backcountry of uh, um, Canyonlands or, or even Mesa Verde. Who knows what is out there? And and that's not your role to to find those places that's where the, the individual park units have to do the field work so to speak yeah no that's true and a lot of parks in the system especially the larger parks like you mentioned they have an incomplete inventory of their archaeological sites um, it's very typical for the larger parks to have you know less than 10 percent of all of their archaeological sites inventoried or a better way to say that is less than 10 percent of their land area um, systematically surveyed to identify archaeological sites. Um, all of that takes time and money, and uh, we just we don't have unlimited resources to do that. But Less than ten percent. We, well, I mean, every park is different. Some parks have a lot more um, land that has been surveyed. Some parks do not. Uh, Wapaki, for example, has uh, nearly complete inventory, but you know it is thirty thousand, you know, a little bit more than thirty thousand acres. Uh, Grand Canyon. Glen Canyon, those are multi-million acre parks, so um, a lot bigger land area and a, a lot more potential archaeological sites. Yeah, I seem to recall, and, and maybe I'm wrong, um, seeing a figure once that less than 2% of Canyonlands National Park had been surveyed for our archaeological resources. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a big park. Grand Canyon is uh, a little bit better. They're probably 7 8 or 9% surveyed. Yeah, it's those bigger parks. And what the Vanishing Treasures program brings to those parks is some guidance on how they might go about documenting those architectural remains when they find them. And if the parks are documenting their architecture, especially looking at structures from the point of view of somebody who's going to be responsible for preserving those sites, what are the unique um, conditions of those structures and what are the unique uh, treatments that we might try in helping those structures stay upright and able to resist the the impacts of uh, weather and normal degradation. Yeah. So we have guidance on how that documentation might be consistent across the region. Yeah. With with um, the ongoing drought here in the Southwest, and of course, you know, everybody knows Lake Powell dropped to historic lows. Um, historic in context of when the Glen Canyon Dam was created. Did that lake level drop reveal archaeological resources that had to be identified and documented? It did. I think it dropped to a point where um, archaeological sites that had been documented prior to the dam were re-exposed, as well as archaeological sites that had not been documented before um, being exposed. And so they were um, in a position to uh, get to those sites and see what the condition was after being underwater for so many years. Yeah. And it's so surprising that um, some archaeological sites in that condition that had been submerged for that long showed, um, you know, not as much damage as you would think, whereas other sites looked like they were, you know, hardly recognizable especially archaeological sites that are near a shoreline where wave action hits the shore and reworks the soil. Um, archaeological sites that are located in those, in those situations are damaged uh, more severely than an archaeological site that might be submerged more deeply. Yeah, I guess there was something similar in, in Grand Canyon with how Burek was um, managing releases from Lake Powell and the different water flows, I believe, damaged some archaeological resources and as well as exposing some. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But then uh, also, you know, introducing sediment into that system that um, helped uh, cover exposed archaeological sites back up. Right. Um, when, the, when the wind reworks those silts and those sands and uh, gently blows across the landscape, it can 
benefit archaeological features that have been exposed and eroded um, yeah. by providing more stability with gently rebearing those features. Yeah, yeah. I had the opportunity in, um, I think it was late October, early November of uh, 2022, to go down to Bandelier National Monument, which is uh, a fascinating place. And I, I think uh, it doesn't get enough attention. And, and maybe that's a good thing because we're dealing with crowds in the national park system. Right. Um, but it's just a fascinating park. And you guys did some work down there to, to develop methods to identify, document, conserve, and maintain the cavates as both the way they were um, constructed in natural heritage. That must have been a fun project. Yeah, I, I think um, a couple of our staff members spent many years at Vandalier helping do that conservation work. And it really helped them. Of course, they helped the park, you know, in preserving these really delicate and very vulnerable types of archaeological sites. Um, you know, the the uh, material that those cavates are carved into is very friable and um, does not hold up well to um, just normal erosion and normal uh, visitor traffic and foot traffic and that kind of thing. Um, so it benefited the park um, in bringing some unique ways of documenting that damage and some treatment uh, types to, um, I, I won't say, it, you know, stopping the, the erosion, but at least slowing it down. Yeah. But what it also did was for the staff members that worked on those projects, um, you know, they took the skills and the methods and the materials that they learned at Bandelier and um, apply those out in other parks and um, helping, you know, those other parks understand, you know, what worked well, what didn't work well, what to focus on in terms of preservation methods. We touched briefly on climate change in terms of, you know, the, the dropping of uh, Lake Powell and, and what was revealed there. Has climate change um, increased your workload recently? <laughs> yeah, uh, boy, has it. Um, we hear from parks across the region about um, especially these record-breaking weather events, uh, both you know wind storms and uh, thunderstorms, with record amounts of precipitation in a very very short period of time, and the landscape just is not designed to absorb that much water that quickly, and so we're seeing a lot of flooding, a lot of direct water um, erosion on archaeological sites as well as uh, structures, um, where Sometimes the rooms of uh, pueblos turn into small swimming pools, wow. and uh, bigger <laughs> and, and bigger problems associated with that. You know, structures like that just are not designed, and probably have uh, experienced very few events like that where they're having to withstand the the forces of uh, direct flooding as well as standing water in the rooms. And yeah, we're seeing that across the region. Yeah, is it safe to say that in a lot of the structures in the Southwest, when they were constructed, it was a drier period? Oh, well, I mean, we have resources that date back, you know, thousands and thousands of years. So it's a pretty broad depth of time. And there were periods within that broader time period where droughts and very dry periods um, predominated across the region. But I think what we're seeing now is on par or exceeds anything that we've or the the sites have experienced in their you know thousand year history. What about you know the, the building materials that they used when they were originally constructed? I mean, do these these rain events, uh, storm events, um, pose a greater threat to to eroding those materials? And, and if so, what approach do you take to try and protect them, reinforce them? Yeah, it's tricky. Um, they're very vulnerable um, to that kind of water erosion. Uh, they were not constructed to withstand uh, that kind of precipitation, for example. And they were constructed with local materials. If you think about um, a stone masonry structure or an adobe structure, those materials came from more or less on site, uh, whatever was available nearby. Um, and those materials are you know, earthen materials are not typically resilient to uh, water erosion or extreme weather events. Um, the structures, you know, require somebody living in them and doing maintenance, continuous maintenance on the inside and outside of the structures to 
uh, withstand, um, you know, like a thunderstorm or a windstorm. You know, damage does happen to structures, you know, that are even lived in, but at least there are people there to do the repair and the maintenance, um, just as your regular normal day-to-day -day routine. Today, we have remnants of those structures that are exposed to the elements and nobody there taking care of the building. So it is a, a tricky situation and, and trying to find materials today that are resilient to the, you know that kind of um, weathering but not so strong that it damages the softer earthen material around it. Yeah, I, I believe um, currently you're, you're doing some, some field work uh, at, at four parks, um, Pecos National Historical Park, Salinas Pueblo Missions National Monument, San Antonio Missions National Historical Park, and Tumacacori um, National Historical Park, uh, trying to gather, I guess, baseline data heading into climate change or, or what exactly is it involving? Yeah, th this is a program to uh, bring uh, hopefully a common approach to um, the realities of our future, both in terms of um, our climate futures, as well as the future of the materials of the structure and the operations of the parks. Well, what we're doing in joining those four parks is bringing in partners and consultants and looking at ways that um, we can do what's called a vulnerability assessment at all four parks in a way where we can compare the results across all four parks and then expand that um, to compare with archeological sites and historic structures across the entire region. And so we're trying to refine what our climate futures look like at each of those four parks we have a pretty good idea of what the the general regional you know forecast is for 50 years down the road in terms of heat and precipitation and that kind of thing um, and so we're trying to refine that down to the scale uh, specific to each of those four parks and with that information then how can the parks position themselves in terms of how do they prioritize the the individual structures that they'll focus on for preservation in the future, uh, what are the materials that they could use, what is the type of data, and what are the indicators of the health of those structures that we can monitor with environmental data going into the future. These are all things that are, are just now this year getting off the ground in terms of developing a protocol or a common strategy across the broader region um, given the realities of, um, you know, less money and less people on staff um, to respond, in, you know, in an appropriate way, you know, given these extreme weather events that might um, come as a result of climate change. Is there a, a, a wide range of approaches that could be taken to preserving some of these places? I mean, I, I'm thinking about um, you've got that, that Spanish mission down at Pecos Historical National Historical Park. I, I can't imagine building some sort of structure over it to, to you know, divert rain away or something like that. But um, is the Park Service allowed to, to use some sort of um, 21st century coding to preserve these structures? Yeah, it's a great question. And parks are starting to ask that. And, and the regional office and my program is starting to to realize that this might be in our future to use some methods and materials that traditionally have not been used uh, because they're pretty hard on the resources. Um, they would do some damage. Um, if it's not to the fabric of the walls themselves, then it would be to damage to the viewscape and how visitors experience that site. Um, if you think about Casa Grande ruins down in Southern Arizona and how that modern constructed roof over the structure um, impinges on the, not just the view, but how a visitor would experience um, walking around that archeological site. So all kinds of damages that could come from that, or at least impacts, if not damages. Um, you're asking about coatings, and that has to do with changing the materials that we use for preservation. And if we couldn't strengthen some of those um, mortars and other earthen material that, um, you know, grouts and plasters and whatnot that we could use um, to strengthen the walls. 
We are looking into all of those options, um, as well as options to prioritize those structures that the park is primarily responsible for and de-emphasizing other structures that might um, better be served with a natural cycle and less frequent preservation treatment work. So we're looking at all options and that is part of this climate change program with the Spanish missions uh, program is to uh, look at those alternatives, not just conceptually, but starting to test the materials of that. Um, so for example, if there was a, a coating that could be demonstrated to be um, soft on the original material and not cause damage. Um, maybe it expands the um, maintenance cycle a few years of that particular room or wall. The appropriate approach to that would be to do some laboratory testing and then maybe do some test walls, um, off-site test walls where you're replicating some of the conditions of the original structure, um, but you're not using the original structure to do the actual test. And those test walls, of course, are, are modern constructions that are you know, built in a way and in a place that doesn't impinge or take away from the, the values of the historic structure or the archeological site. Yeah. If, you, if, you, if you monitor those test walls uh, appropriately and you set the parameters up ahead of time, then it can give you a lot of information about how those materials will perform under different conditions going into the future. So that is part of this climate change pr uh, program that we're talking about. Does a park have to invite you out to come look at a structure or say you're driving across the West on a vacation and you stop in at a park and you see a place and you say, oh, it's falling down. It needs to be addressed. Um, one one location I can think of is, is Minidoka National Historic Site in Idaho and the, the root cellar up there that, you know, un unfortunately it looks like it's just collapsing down upon itself and, and going to disappear. Is that something where the, the, the park has to invite you to come um, analyze it? Or like I, like I wondered, you know, can you identify sites that you stumble upon? Uh, both. Um, I think by and large, though, the work we do and the assistance we give the parks come through uh, good communication and um, that's the you know communication between the Vanishing Treasures program and the park, but also between one park and another park. And we think that's invaluable in terms of um, parks creating their own networks of um, experts and people who can respond. So we get word from visiting parks, you know, um, uh, how do you say it, like off subject. So we're there for a different reason or we're driving through on other business and we identify things. That's absolutely something that happens. Uh, but more frequently, we get requests from the park, you know, a technical assistance request uh, from the park itself, um, asking for assistance with um, a particular structure. <laughs> but what happens a lot is uh, we go and we look at uh, that one structure, uh, like the root cellar at Minidoka, and um, that one problem turns into 10, yeah. right? <laughs> That's pretty yeah. typical. And then that one site, um, as long as we're there, you know, a typical response from the park or an invitation will, will go something like, hey, as long as you're here looking at this, could <laughs> we get you to look at um, this thing over here? Yeah. And then pretty soon we've got, um, you know, multiple structures and multiple issues. And it's really a challenge to help prioritize those and help the park kind of look into their future at, um, you know, how to how to take care of these things. Yeah, especially if you're a, a park manager responsible for doing preservation work, it, it can be daunting knowing how much work there is and how few people and resources you have. But we help the parks kind of focus on, you know, their primary priority and, and taking care of things one, one bit at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the, the, the backcountry work at Wapatki. Um most unusual project that you've been involved with? Can you can you think of something, or is Wapaki it? Unusual in the sense of uh, satisfying and um... well, like that that cabin I was uh, up in the Matiti Wilderness with this old house. I mean, that was a pretty unusual project, and you know, watching them trying to, to raise beams, you know, without uh, you know just using muscle, sweat, and muscle. Um, or interesting location. 
I'm sure you've got a thousand stories and I'm just wondering if one stands out above the rest. Yeah. Lots and lots of stories, uh, in that regard, both, you know, on the grand scale as well as the, the micro scale, but, um, something in between, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, Glen Canyon national recreation area, um, uh, requested assistance with, um, some structures that they have in their wilderness area in their back country. And, uh, the Vanishing Treasures program helped them look at it. Um, they had a little bit of funding to get some work done, so we helped them plan a project um, in the uh, Escalante district. And it was a thousand-year-old, maybe maybe 850 or 900-year-old ancestral Puebloan structure that was built into an alcove shelter hmm. with um, materials from the, the cliff fall and the sand and the, the sediment from the creek right below it. Um, just a, a great setting, a great wilderness setting, um, and a, a, a real challenge in terms of how do you get um, how do you get materials and people in there, and what kinds of uh, treatments can you do in a situation like that, um, where we're using the softest materials possible, where we've got just real simple hand tools to help get our work done, and so we went in and we were able to. Um, find a clay source nearby, which was suggested by people who had, um, you know, been to that site prior to us. Um, but the, the source itself had not been pinpointed, but we think we found um, that source right there in the creek. So we had to combine that clay with sands that were available nearby. And we looked to see what um, the, the appropriate sand might be and what the ratio of sand to clay, uh, what the best mix is. You can't have too much clay and you can't have too much sand. It's somewhere in between. So we did a little testing uh, in that regard, you know, on the fly. So, you know, this is backpacking in, uh, you know, a dozen miles or so and trying to figure this stuff out while we're there for just a few days. So we, you know, came in with uh, our understanding of what might need to be done. And then you kind of experiment and, and uh, you know, find what's going to work off site. And then once you get that down, then we were able to do some really, really light mortar and stonework on that structure and uh, hopefully strengthen it going forward into the future. Um, but very gratifying, very satisfying and, and unusual in that um, we were so far in the back country um, that we were very limited on, you know, what we can bring with us and what kind of tools and, and uh, you know, the ability to improvise in the field a lot of times we try to work all that out ahead of time, right? So we don't have to be in that situation to make stuff up as we go along. But in this case, we put ourselves in that situation, understanding that the original builders and the materials that they used were available right in the immediate area. At least that was the assumption. And that if we did it right, then if we reuse those uh, materials that were available locally, uh, we could probably come up with a pretty good treatment solution. And, and that's what we did. That sounds pretty cool, Ian. Um, a fascinating aspect of the National Park Service that I'm sure most people are not aware of. Um, it sounds like very challenging work, but very rewarding at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. To leave a site after having worked on it like that. And, you know, from a distance, you couldn't tell that we worked there because our work blended very well with the original work. Uh, because we used those original softer earthen materials. But then knowing also if you got up close to the site and looked at the walls, you could see where all the erosion channels had been filled in and how the, the mortar joints between the stones had been filled in in a way that uh, strengthened the bonds between the stones and across the wall face. So, yeah, just, just real satisfying knowing that we can go in and do, you know, our work in a very light way. Um, and then contribute to the preservation of a place like that. Yeah, yeah. D do the other land management agencies, the Forest Service and BLM, have similar programs, or, or do they borrow your uh, expertise from time to time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I don't think the Bureau of Land Management or the U.S. Forest Service has um, a program with quite the emphasis that Vanishing Treasures does. Um, although they do have funding and people who are involved with uh, preservation work and they get that done through partnerships, just like we do. Um, they might not do as much work as we do across the, the region, 
but they certainly are involved with that and um, getting you know these places um, some attention in terms of preservation. We do, they do borrow us for sure. Uh, we're working with the U.S. Forest Service, the Santa Fe National Forest um, in the Pecos District to look at um, uh, log picnic shelters um, that were put up in these campgrounds uh, up the canyon. And they're having just some, you know, pretty predictable issues with uh, wood deterioration and settling of uh, foundations on the chimneys and that kind of thing. All problems that are pretty typical of log structures in this area but um, they did reach out to us and we are partnering with helping them you know come up with some solutions and um, taking a look at you know how to repair some of those logs or replace them whether need be or do some foundation work yeah. uh, with the Bureau of Land Management we have partnered with the um, Pony Express National Historic Trail and uh, bringing them some attention to structures that are in need of some preservation work. Um, but again, we're limited. The Managing Churches program doesn't have a crew that we can send out into the region uh, and, and do all this work, uh, but we can find people to partner with. And that's really the future of preservation work in our region is developing, partnering, and assisting and consulting with partner organizations to actually do uh, planning and, and the hands-on work. That's Ian Huff. He's the program coordinator of the National Park Service's Vanishing Treasures program. Ian, it's a, a fascinating program that you're working with there and um, look forward down the road to see what kind of solutions um, you and your team come up with to try and protect some of these structures from, from more time. Yeah, absolutely. Great being with you today, and yeah, if um, if you're ever in Santa Fe, stop by, and we can give you a, a tour of the building and um, whatever else you need. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. The Vanishing Treasures program is one of the more unusual aspects of the National Park Service that goes under the public's radar, but which pays big benefits in working to preserve the unique, historic, and archaeological treasures within the National Park System. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Rappencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.